Hello and welcome to our second video on the third article of the Apostles' Creed. We're talking about the results that are here in the world now because of who Jesus was, that he is both God and man in one person, and because of what he has done, that he was crucified, died, buried, that he rose again, ascended into heaven, and that one day he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Uh, today, we're, as we look at the third article, we're seeing that there uh, now is always going to be people in the world who believe in Jesus, who believe in who he is and believe in what he has done. Uh, and as this continues throughout generation after generation, we can recognize this and we too can be a part of this massive movement that God is accomplishing throughout human history uh, of people who are called out of darkness to now put their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so today we want to talk a little bit more about what is this group of people who believe in Jesus. Uh, in the Apostles' Creed, we talk about the communion of saints. Uh, communion is often a, a, thing, a way to talk about uh, unity with people, um, but uh, we can often mistake that word communion because it's not a word that we often use. Uh, if you go back to earlier English, uh, communion actually comes from two words put together, common and union. Okay, So there is a common union of all of these believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, another word that the Bible often uses is, is fellowship. Uh, once again, fellowship, if you go to the Old English, where this came from, it comes from two words, fellow shape, right? There is a common union, a fellow shape for all Christians everywhere. There is something unique, something different that sets Christians apart from the rest of humanity. So what exactly is this common union, this fellowship of Christians? Well, let's look in the scriptures that we're in at a couple places that talk about this common union, this fellow shape. Uh, in 1 John chapter 1, uh, we read this, these words, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have observed and our hands have touched regarding the word of life, the life appeared and we have seen it. We testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We are proclaiming what we have seen and heard also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to you so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, but still walk in the darkness, we are lying and do not put the truth into practice. But if we walk in the light, just as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. This is God's word. So what is the fellow shape? What is the common union of Christians according to what uh, John says here? First off, again, there's always uh, focused on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. But he also speaks about sin and grace. That as a Christian, you are not finding your identity, your value in who you are and what you can accomplish. No, instead, as a Christian, you admit your faults. You confess that you are darkness. You confess that you do not do what is right and that you continually do what is wrong. But as a Christian, as you do continually confess your sins, God is there to forgive you. And so this is the common union that you are going to see in all real Christians, all people who believe in Jesus Christ. They're not going to point to themselves as being the best of humanity. Instead, they are going to confess their own sins. And they're going to trust in God that he has not rejected them because of those sins, but instead that he continues to forgive. And this is consistently what you see of God's people even throughout the Bible, right? Uh, you look at the, the 12 disciples. They're all cowards. They're horribly slow to understand what Jesus has to say. The apostle Peter, one of the leader, leaders of the apostles, he actually denies knowing Jesus three times, and yet God forgives him. So too with many of the heroes of faith, right? Uh, King David, he's, he's uh, re really uh, venerated, really valued for his uh, great defeat of uh, the giant Goliath, right? And yet, he was an adulterer and a murderer. And yet, he is still a man after God's own heart. Not because he was so perfect, but because he recognized his sins. He confessed them. And he received God's forgiveness. 
Look at Moses, the great leader of God's people in the Old Testament, right? Moses, too, was a murderer. He took a man's life. And yet, God did not forsake him. God forgave him his sins. So it is, consistently, throughout the scriptures, we find that God's people are failures as, as, as humans. They do it as wrong. We all do. And yet, we confess those sins. We admit that we have done wrong, and yet Jesus came to die for me, to forgive me of my sins. And he came to forgive you of your sins too. This is what, what Christianity has consistently preached, consistently proclaimed throughout the centuries. Uh, in fact, we get this same word, not just from the Apostle John, but also from the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 21, we read, But now, completely apart from the law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. In fact, there is no difference because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly displayed as the atonement seat through faith in his blood. God did this to demonstrate his justice. Since in his divine restraint, he had left the sins that were committed earlier unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so that he would be both just and the one who justifies the person who has faith in Jesus. What happens to boasting then? It has been eliminated. By what principle? By the principle of works? No, but by the principle of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith without the works of the law. Or is it he only, or is he only the God of the Jews? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, also of the Gentiles, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised person by faith and the uncircumcised person through the same through the very same faith. So are we doing away with the law by this faith? Absolutely not. Instead, we are upholding the law. Here the Apostle Paul uh, explains this reality, this common union, this fellowship of Christians, that we recognize that every single human who has ever lived has fallen short. We have failed to be the people that we ought to be. And yet, God has not forsaken us. He has not rejected, it, rejected us because he has justified. He has declared us to be not guilty through what Jesus Christ has done. And so, as he says, uh, for, for all these people, this gathering of believers, we no longer boast in ourselves. We don't boast about how good we are compared to everybody else. Instead, we confess our failures, but we boast about what Jesus has done for us. We brag about our Savior who has been so generous to us, giving us this salvation that doesn't come from who we are and what we do, but instead comes from God and from his mercy. And again, this gives us this new life to be able to be honest about our sins, to pursue a real moral life instead of pretending that we're way better than we actually are. This is the common union of Christians. This is the, the fellow shape of believers in Jesus Christ. And so let's continue this, this discussion of, of what it is that unites Christians everywhere. Uh, we've already hinted at this a little bit here in this common union of saints. Uh, but next we're talking about uh, the forgiveness of sins. And before we jump into that, <clears throat> I want to take a particular look at a, a Greek word uh, that talks about forgiveness. A, the Greek word that we find in the Old Testament, one of the words at least, uh, that we use for forgiveness. And that word is aphiemi. That word literally just means to let go. Okay. And it can be used in a lot of different senses. In fact, it's actually the word for legally divorce. Divor if you're legally divorcing your wife, right? Uh, you're letting go of your wife, right? So that uh, a man and a wife can go their separate ways and do something else, right? But think about how the Bible describes divorce, right? Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, uh, the way the Bible describes uh, marriage is that uh, two people will become one flesh, that a, a husband will, or an, a, a man rather, will leave behind that family unit that he had with his father and mother, and he's instead going to be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The scriptures say that what God has joined together, man should not separate. And so when divorce happens, biblically speaking, this one flesh, this unity where there are no seams anymore, is being viciously, violently ripped apart. It's a horrific thing. It's a brutal thing. And it causes that pain and destruction and devastation in a lot of people's lives. Now, compare that to your forgiveness. 
You see, when God says, I forgive you of your sins, he's not some doting grandma saying, oh, you shouldn't have taken so many cookies, right? I mean, again, picture that, right? If <laughs> if God's going to forgive Hitler's sins and he's just some doting grandma saying, oh, Hitler, you shouldn't have killed so many people. Stop being so naughty, right? That's not real justice. Nobody wants a God like that, right? Think about this, right? If I punch you in the face, okay, and then you and I go before the judge, right? Assault and battery is the charge here, right? And the judge just looks at me and says, you know what? I forgive you. How are you going to respond to that? You're going to be upset, right? That's not justice, right? Something needs to happen. Because when I sin against you, I owe you a moral debt, right? This is why you have this visceral need for justice, right? This is why we naturally want to seek revenge against those people who wrong us, right? Because I owe you something. But to forgive is to let go of that debt that I owe you. It can be a brutal thing. It requires you to absorb that injustice, to absorb uh, that violence against you, right? Real forgiveness is not a doting grandma. Real forgiveness is a brutal, uh, difficult thing. And in fact, if anybody has ever really wronged you in life, you know just how difficult real forgiveness can be. And so when God forgives you and me for our sins, some people will ask, you know, well, how, how, come, how come God had to forgive sins by having Jesus die in such a brutal way, right? How come he had to be crucified and all that, right? Couldn't God, if he's God, if he can do anything, whatever he wants, right? Couldn't he just say, you're all forgiven? That wouldn't be real justice, right? And so this is why we need the forgiveness of sins. This is why the common union of saints, the assembly of believers, gathers around the forgiveness of sins. In the Lutheran Church, pretty much every single one of our church services involves some form of confession and absolution where we admit that we have failed and we hear the pastor say, your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus. So let's talk about this a little bit more. Let's dig into Ephesians chapter 4 that talks about this forgiveness of sins, this divorce from our evil that has been so, uh, so, part, so much a part of us. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, But you did not learn Christ in that way, if indeed you have heard of him and were taught in him, since the truth is in Jesus. As far as your former way of life is concerned, you were taught to take off the old self, which is corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be renewed continually in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, which has been created to be like God in righteousness and true holiness." Now think about how uh, the Apostle Paul is describing your sin there. He describes it as your old self, right? Similarly to how we talked about marriage being two people becoming one flesh, one uh, united, one organism uh, that doesn't have seams, right? Disconnecting it. In the same way, your sin, your evil, it's one flesh with you. There's not like a good part of you and a bad part of you, right? It's not the cartoon like you got a devil on one shoulder and an angel on another. The Bible says you are all evil. This is why uh, uh, Martin Luther, as he or explains uh, the third article, says, I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ or come to him, right? Because that is how full of evil I am. But through Jesus Christ, God has made you a new person. And therefore, the battle against your sin is this putting off of your old self, right? It's becoming this new person that you are in Jesus Christ because you have been divorced from that evil. God has gone through the, the visceral, brutal nature, the brutal reality of tearing every ounce of your evil from who you are. And he did that when Jesus died on the cross. And so you are continually, always forgiven for all of the evil that you are for all of the evil that you accomplish, for all of the good that you have left undone, God continually forgives you. And this is, again, what people who believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Christian Church, continually gathers around. This again, 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 hearing. You are forgiven in the name of Jesus. The scriptures uh, continue to talk about this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, there at verse 16, uh, we read, As a result, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we knew Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him that way. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. 
and he has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ inasmuch as God is making an appeal through us. We urge you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who, ha- who did not know sin to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. A lot of fascinating stuff in this section here. Again, we have this still concept that the old self that you were, what you used to be outside of Jesus is now gone. Now you are this new creation, the Apostle Paul explains. And then he gets in this whole topic of reconciliation, right? Uh, When a, a loving relationship breaks down, it needs reconciliation. That word means for for a broken relationship to be mended again, right? And so for every single sin that you and I commit, for every single good thing that you and I fail to do, that destroys our relationship with God. That separates us from him. But in Jesus, God has mended that relationship so that we are again united to Christ, so that we are again one with God. And that happens through who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so uh, now we have, we, we are, as we continue to gather around Jesus, as we continue to talk about Jesus and what he has done, who he is, right? We are ambassadors. We are coming to this world from God to proclaim to them what Jesus has done. To announce that everybody else's sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ too. They also can believe it. They also can be reunited to God. That broken relationship mended again. And finally, he has this fascinating description of, again, how exactly God did this. How he divorced us from our evil, tore it away from us. He says that God made him who had no sin, who who did not know sin, right? Jesus, this perfect one human being. And God made him sin. So when Jesus went to that cross, he took every single ounce of our sin with him. So that all of God's wrath over our sin was directed straightly at Jesus Christ. And justice has now been done. The full payment for our sins. And that brutal death of Jesus on the cross, God has fully justified his wrath against sin. He has fully satisfied real justice so that you and I can now be one with God again. This brings us to uh, to our final section here, <clears throat> that because uh, of this group of people all gathering around what Jesus has done, as we have this fellow shape, this common union, as we gather around this continual forgiveness of sins, as we continue to speak about that forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, we are looking forward to Jesus coming again, when we will fa- see the resurrection and the life everlasting. And the Bible gives us some beautiful descriptions of that eternal life that we are looking forward to. Uh, we're going to look at three uh, such descriptions. First one from 1 John chapter 3, it says, See the kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The world does not know us because it did not know him. Dear friends, we are children of God now. But what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he is revealed, We will be like him and we will see him as he really is. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. Everyone who commits sin also commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. Anyone who remains in him does not sin. The person who keeps on sinning has not seen him or known him. Again, the, from 1 John, uh, the Apostle John speaks very fast in, in a very fascinating way. Uh, but he says something there that's very interesting. He says, we do not yet know what we will be. I often, as a pastor, I get a lot of questions about what exactly is heaven going to be like, right? Uh, what is eternal life going to be like? What is the resurrection going to be like? We don't act, honestly know. <laughs> the Bible gives us a lot of uh, uh, artsy pictures of what eternal life is going to be like, uh, but it says very little concretely of, of what exactly it's going to be like. The best picture really is is, uh, basically just the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, What life was like before sin was there. The scriptures tell us that we will have glorified bodies, even better than the the, the bodies we currently have. And yet it's, it's not that we're leaving these bodies behind. God is going to resurrect this very body that God has given to me already, right? Your body as well. So again, a fascinating thing. Uh, At the resurrection, God is going to put you back together, body and soul back together. Um, The scriptures describe human death, physical death, as the the ripping apart of body and soul. The resurrection, therefore, is God putting you back together. So you are, again, a whole human being. 
to live eternally with your God. Let's get another uh, description of this eternal life. In Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 18, we read, For I conclude that our suffering at the present time, our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. In fact, creation is waiting with eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to futility, not by its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that even creation itself will be set free from slavery to corruption in order to share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that all of creation is groaning with birth pains right up to the present time. And not only creation, but also we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Indeed, it was for this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is, no ho- is not hope, because who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for something we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patient endurance. The Apostle Paul acknowledges that life can be full of a lot of suffering right now. Life can be very difficult, absolutely cruel sometimes. But Paul says, what we are looking forward to, the eternal life that is that is coming for us, that is going to be so amazing that it's not even worth comparing to the sufferings that we have right now, the, the difficulties in life that we face right here and right now. Then he goes off on this, this fascinating concept that, that the very creation around us, right, the very matter uh, that, that surrounds us in this world, right, that too is waiting to see who the sons of God will be, who the, who the believers will be on the last day. Right, right now, you can't see if somebody's a believer, right? You can see their words and actions, right? But you can't actually see into their heart. The scriptures say that even creation itself is waiting, longing to see who those people are going to be. Those people who will be with God for all eternity. One final uh, section for us today as we again talk about the, the resurrection from the dead and the life everlasting. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1, it says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked when you followed the ways of this present world. You were following the ruler of the dominion of the air, the spirit now at work in the people who disobey. Formerly, we all lived among them in the passions of our sinful flesh as we carried out the desires of the sinful flesh and its thoughts. Like all the others, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. But... God, because he is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. He also raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He did this so that in the coming ages he might demonstrate the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance, so that we would walk in them. A lot that Paul digs into there, but I think it's really just a good summary of everything we've talked about here today. Uh, and so with that, uh, I encourage you, if you have any questions on the creed, please do leave them in the comments or, or contact me any way you can, uh, and I, I'll try to get back to you. Uh, and with that, God's richest blessings on you until we meet again. And I say, I say, I say, it can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, it wasn't easy. But be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God.